okay professor uh, we will start now yes yeah. So a warm welcome to you and many, many thanks uh, for accepting our invitation for uh, giving this uh, webinar talk uh, for IEEE's Hyderabad chapter. So before starting, I would just uh, uh, like to uh, uh, tell about IEEE's Hyderabad chapter. We very recently started it. And as you know that uh, we started this uh, program uh, or webinar activity from March onward, and we had very 12 interesting talks and uh, uh, and uh, another one by Professor uh, James Raju. So Professor uh, Raju is currently serving as head uh, Center for Advanced Studies in Electronic Science and Technology School of uh, Physics at University of Hyderabad. He completed his PhD from IIT Chennai in 96 uh, on low loss microwave dielectrics and joined University of Hyderabad in 96 and became professor in 2009. He has graduated about 15 PhD students, 25 masters, and he has also completed more than 12 sponsored projects and has published over uh, 160 papers and filed three patents. And uh, Professor Raju is heading a project on magnetoelectrics for microwave uh, devices and another one on laser annealing. Is also associated with ITC IRST uh, at Trento, Italy, and University of uh, uh, Puerto Rico, USA, and University of Cambridge, UK, for uh, different assignments abroad. And he is currently working in the areas of microwave measurement techniques for different types of materials, low loss dielectrics, ferroelectric thin films, microwave and laser base processing of materials and magnetoelectric materials and tunable microwave devices and resonators with these words and with such an experience uh, uh, that he is having we are delighted to uh, invite you sir and then uh, request you to please uh, start your presentation uh, thank you dr ashok uh, for the kind introduction and uh, uh, in fact i am one of the first generation i two plus members it was uh, formed in around the year uh, 2001 at that time itself we became members and uh, in hyderabad somehow the activities uh, did not take off early but now thanks to dr ashok and his team it is, is really taking off we are very happy about it but uh, in our university more people are yet to know about it so i will uh, try to popularize it i'm very really, um, uh, glad to um, uh, uh, present this talk before all of you today uh, <clears throat> then uh, see i see basically uh, I would like to introduce the uh, area which is a little interdisciplinary, uh, which involves materials, phenomena, and processes, ultimately meant for microwave device applications. And, uh, uh, and therefore, since uh, this involves uh, a few areas which is a little less familiar, uh, in fact, I would like to uh, introduce the subject, then that is what primarily I will be doing it. And if anybody want to interrupt me at any time, please feel free to do so. And uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, anyway, of course, the first and foremost, I need to um, uh, acknowledge those who are, made these works possible, and uh, they are my students and postdocs and my colleagues at University of Hyderabad and various funding agencies and uh, um, various collaborating labs. Uh, in fact, uh, um, um, uh, I'm um grateful to all of them and uh, some of the. Um, uh, uh, our team members are uh, on, uh, in this slide. Uh, they, uh, still more are there. Okay, uh, 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 the, these are students who have graduated. In fact, uh, the Sandi Sharma graduated just uh, one hour back. Uh, his viva today got completed just one hour back. <laughs> and I uh, will be presenting about these aspects. A little ambitious. I will try to cover as much as possible uh, microwave frequency range, its importance and applications and devices and the characteristics of materials for applications in the micro range, measurement techniques for materials in the micro range, material parameter, uh, material preparation and micro energy, um, uh, what micro energy can do when it comes to material preparation, and then uh, material preparation for uh, devices, what are te the techniques which uh, we are using for them, and the laser annealing uh, to make ferroelectric uh, processes compatible with that of uh, semiconductors, and uh, microwave devices that are possible with these materials, and then, and then uh, some of the additional works which are possible with these devices, non-magnetic, non-reciprocal devices, 
for duplex communication and quantum acoustic devices, and then better micro uh, better devices with um, magnetoelectric multi layers. I would like to cover these topics. Um, First, uh, uh, this uh, microwave frequency range. Why? Uh, what is the importance of it? And what are the applications and devices uh, 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 needed to make it possible? And uh, first and foremost, we know uh, these uh, micro devices nowadays have become um, uh, and, uh, so important mainly because of this handheld uh, smartphone, which in fact, which is a combination of so many things uh, in one. Therefore, uh, that uh, in, in fact uh, now. As all roads leads to Rome, now, in fact, so many technologies, almost all technologies now lead to a smartphone. The next set of devices that will get in get incorporated into a smartphone are likely to be uh, biomedical devices, which will uh, do a lot of uh, biomedical sensing uh, for uh, of the user. And that also data can be straight away stored in the uh, mobile and it uh, can be sent to the cloud and things like that. Therefore, uh, that, uh, this uh, mobile phone um, and it's coming has increased the importance of micro frequency range tremendously. Then about micro oven we know. Then 5G networks which are coming up thanks to um, this IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, in fact, even devices need to be networked. That requires a whole lot of additional uh, these wireless links. Then uh, one of the classical applications of uh, microwave link is the radar. Uh, that of course at one point of time uh, it, it, this was the most important uh, application but nowadays okay this is uh, one among the many applications then for long distance communications uh, a microwave is one of the is always one of the unique link uh, whether it is communicated with the aircraft the satellite ships uh, any of those things and then uh, a deep space network uh, that uh, 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 communicating with the deep space probes, whether it, uh, in fact, uh, uh, including uh, objects that are as far like uh, Voyager 1 and 2. The only way right now is uh, through micro link. And then uh, when it comes to defense, uh, in fact, a uh, whole lot of uh, activities uh, uh, in the defense sector happens uh, through micro link. That is a field in itself. And uh, therefore, uh, microwaves uh, plays a very important role in technology that is for, uh, there's no doubt about it. And uh, why it is so? That is, uh, to a great extent, it is because of the information carrying capacity. The micro frequency range is not that small as that of RF, but also, even though it is not that high as that of optical fiber. And uh, uh, even the limitations in the information carrying capacity in the micro frequency range is overcome. Uh, by the frequency reuse techniques that came of the cellular telephone. That is why the mobile uh, revolution came. Uh, this all has, you now why is, uh, the, the, everybody is trying to skew into the micro range because data comes up to the uh, base station through the optical fiber. Hmm? Well, when it comes to last mile connectivity, it is uh, for, that is for free space communication, it is uh, micro. The reason is, uh, the, the propagation through the atmosphere is uh, unobstructed by daylight, fog, cloud, rain, dust, dielectric obstacles, line of sight, etc. Therefore, uh, it is those aspects which uh, makes microwaves uh, highly useful for our last mile connectivity. And another one is antenna size is moderate. Then, uh, with the uh, semiconductor revolution, miniaturized microwave electronics became possible. And that is one of the reasons why a mobile telephony came up in the 90s. That, in, that goes closely in connection with uh, nature resistance semiconductors. Uh, as you know, in the electromagnetic spectrum, micro range lies between radio waves and infrared. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, and, and that is where it is located. And uh, uh, this uh, in the microwave frequency range, uh, the middles play a very key role. Of course, uh, most of the micro devices uh, which we use in the mobile handset and things like that are uh, semiconductor based. Primarily, three, three phase semiconductors are preferred for high end applications. But uh, uh, the silicon germanium based uh, devices are increasingly being used. And uh, silicon can be used in ultra miniaturized cases. For, for example, when it comes to this uh, mm, uh, the, the, this uh, mm, 28, uh, 45 nanometer technology and all, this FT is quite high. Therefore, frequency comes naturally in the gigahertz range. But the, uh, there, the distance traveled by the signal between the devices is too small. Therefore, uh, silicon, even though it is lossy in these frequency ranges, uh, it is still possible. Uh, therefore, uh, that is why, in fact, uh, uh, nowadays at a high frequency ranges, um, a handset can really uh, uh, can seamlessly operate to a great extent because of these factors. There are a lot of details behind it. I will not get into those things now. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a, with the semiconductors, the primary problem is, is with the eddy current loss. 
and, uh, and it cannot uh, ex uh, exhibit a, a, a reciprocity and also it don't it cannot give mixitonability except in a reverse by SRP injection diode and uh, but when it comes to this um, uh, high frequency circuits tuning and high q is very very important hmm? and the tuning and the tuning means okay like in the ancient radio uh, when we change a knob the station changes effectively what you are doing we are uh, changing a gang condenser accordingly with the resonant frequency changes and then uh, in at present of course we in uh, those mechanical things we cannot do at these frequencies therefore electronically we need to tune and appropriate devices are defined uh, for that as i mentioned in the case of semiconductors, only reverse bias RP injection diode is available. Therefore, we had to look for uh, that is lossy, especially as the frequency increases. Therefore, we had to look for other alternatives. And also, if you look at the Q value of the um, inductors and capacitors in the micro frequency range, they are so low, uh, they are in double digits. But, uh, they can, uh, uh, but the Q required in miniaturized micro circuits is in thousands. Therefore, non conventional way is required there also. And not only that, in a uh, the, uh, in, in an AC circuit, the variables are only R, L, and C, and R lead only to loss. So ultimately, we are reduced to uh, L and C, and uh, in the uh, uh, inductor cannot be miniaturized. So ultimately, we are uh, left to leave the capacitor. Therefore, uh, this, uh, if you want to get tuning, we should go for uh, um, uh, uh, voltage dependent uh, capacitor and uh, uh, this uh, uh, and also if you have high q uh, resonators the in fact uh, uh, a resonator a resonant frequency is one by root lc therefore uh, it is equivalent to having an inductor and capacitance together therefore even though we cannot uh, achieve uh, high q inductors and capacitors it is possible to achieve uh, high q uh, resonators uh, you by exploiting certain material properties and that way we bypass various limitations which are encountered in the conventional um, uh, the solid state micro circuits and for that we have to bring in other materials and uh, properties into the um, uh, high frequency circuits and uh, um, those properties will come across as we go and uh, the means to attaining attain tuning in small dimensions and uh, uh, high frequencies are through variable capacitance or variable inductance as i mentioned and of which uh, variable capacitance is preferred as it is uh, 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 as it can be uh, miniaturized and uh, the best way to achieve q value in small free dimensions at high frequencies is through uh, electro acoustic resonance convert electrical oscillations acoustic oscillations and make a resonator with that and then convert back into electro um, electromagnetic signals and uh, 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 and therefore, uh, let's see, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, explosive growth of uh, um, these uh, microwave circuits uh, with the increasing uh, mobile telephony related uh, demands, and uh, uh, the, the, apart from semiconductors, additional other, I mean, other materials are required. Some of the materials which are being used for high frequency applications these days are low loss dielectrics, semi insulators that can be converted to semiconductors. The stuff example is uh, three phase semiconductors like the Galliard Snade. Uh, then uh, uh, this uh, multi junctions like um, the, the, the multi layers like uh, Galliard Snade and Aluminium Galliard Snade, where the interface can give a two dimensional electron gas, is meant for uh, hemp, and they are used uh, as active devices in the micro frequency range. Then piezoelectrics for electroacoustics, this electromechanical conversion requires piezoelectric effect, and ferrites for non reciprocity. Then uh, low loss material uh, metals and the superconductors. Uh, because metallic loss is a major loss, therefore, to reduce that, superconductors will help. Then, ferroelectrics, because they can give a voltage dependent capacitance and then, uh, through the variable dial constant. Then, magnetoelectrics, which has got the best of both magnetic and uh, electric uh, properties. Then, liquid crystals, they also can give variable capacitance. Uh, then, uh, the uh, materials, uh, thin films like vanadium oxide, which can give a metal insulator transition. Therefore, at one temperature, it will be like a metal, another temperature will be insulated. Therefore, um, for microwaves with that phenomena, we can make various uh, uh, devices. And then absorbers, that is very important, not only for stealth applications in the strategy sector, even to isolate one electronics block from, uh, from another electronics block. Uh, uh, in fact, absorbers are very useful even in, uh, um, uh, device, even in uh, so small systems. Then in the micro frequency range, the materials that are of imp importance are uh, when it comes to dielectrics, the value of a real and imaginary part of the permittivity and their frequency and temperature dependence, 
and when it comes to magnetic materials, the real and imaginary part of permeability and their frequency and temperature dependence. When the conductor conductors, the complex conductivity. Mm. Uh, uh, when it comes to superconductors, that is better, but of course, temperature is issue. And uh, uh, then, first of all, if you want to deal with these materials which are suitable for microwave frequency range, first we should have uh, techniques for measuring their microwave range, uh, their properties in the microwave range. That itself is an issue because uh, microwave uh, the measurement techniques depends upon uh, the uh, the property itself. For example, the techniques uh, for measuring the microwave dielectric properties is different from that of magnetic property and also different from uh, conducting property. And uh, uh, that, uh, in, uh, for example, uh, for uh, dielectric property measurement, we we'll have to keep the sample in the maximum electric field region uh, of a, um, uh, a transmission line system. For magnetic material, we have to use the maximum field region. For conductivity measurement, we have to use the uniform current density region of the uh, test structure. Then uh, sample form, whether the sample is in powder form, uh, bulk form, thin film form, or liquid, because each of them require different uh, structure with its own calibration and data direction procedures. Then whether the material absorber or not, techniques are different. Then whether the dielectric constant or permeability or law, dielectric loss, all these things, whether their values are high or low, your techniques for both are different. For example, microwave field will enter into a um, uh, low, in, in a low dielectric constant material, microwave field will easily enter. But a high dielectric constant material reflect just like a metal. Therefore, uh, the, uh, the, material, uh, the actual value of the property also matters. Then measuring frequency range and bands. Um, broadband techniques uh, are required for broad, uh, measurement of properties over a wide range of frequencies. And narrow band techniques are required uh, for measurement of uh, uh, properties over a narrow band. And generally, narrow band techniques will be more accurate. Uh, but they'll give only data only over a, a small range of frequencies. And then uh, this, uh, many of the band-based techniques are band-limited. Uh, therefore, band by band, we have to change the setup. Mm -hmm. And accuracy uh, the differs, and uh, setup is also different for each case. All that is happening because of the boundary conditions inside a uh, test structure um, is different for uh, according to the geometry and according to the material used for the boundary. If you take the uh, case of waveguide, uh, this uh, See, the, if the blue is the electric field and red is the magnetic field, see, it is a, for in a, it is a propagating like that. See, electric field will be and, and, uh, uh, for every half wavelength, electric field will be changing its direction. Sim similarly, magnetic field will be changing. Say, here, it, if it is uh, anti clockwise, here it will be clockwise. Uh, for like that, it will be keep changing. And accordingly, we have to design the uh, test structure. And field pattern is different for different modes. And uh, Mm, uh, and also uh, uh, the uh, the regions where the, this varying um, magnetic field will induce a current that also depends upon the magnetic field pattern. Therefore, the current density on the surface of the waveguide also varies. So all these things need to be considered while we design a test track. And the primary instrument we use for measurement in the micro frequency uh, frequency range is a vector network analyzer, and uh, this is the instrument, and it has got. Uh, uh, see, if generally uh, it is connected with the coaxial cable, and uh, for measurements, we use mostly waveguide. If we use a waveguide based test structure, we had to use a coaxial to waveguide adapter. In between, we put a test, uh, what is that, uh, this waveguide sample holder. Inside that, we will keep the sample. And uh, what the instrument measures is uh, S parameters, scattering parameters. That primarily, they are complex reflection and uh, transmission uh, coefficients from both directions. And uh, uh, see if, uh, uh, for example, you can measure uh, if in the middle uh, this is a um, sample holder, it will measure the scattering parameters on either side of it. Uh, but uh, uh, from that, deriving the material parameters is not a straightforward job. For that, that is very dependent upon the nature of the material, appropriate uh, data direction procedures were, were to work out each case separately. And uh, that is why we have. Uh, a totally different kind of uh, um, uh, test structures available uh, for micro measurement. For example, this is a very good basic technique, and uh, this is the uh, a particular uh, um, uh, test structure, um, uh, a standard waveguide in which these are the, some of the standard samples for measurement. Uh, this is a, a test structure meant for uh, um, uh, measurement of, uh, of the uh, liquid sample. And uh, the, uh, this is a coaxial probe, and this is a resonator connected to the same network analyzer. This is a split post dielectric resonator, 
and this is for free space measurement. The same DNA is connected to uh, to broadband antennas, and the, 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 it will uh, beam the way through free space, and it will get reflected from here. And this is a sample; it will pass through that, and it will get reflected from here. And uh, therefore, uh, we have transmit line based technique, co uh, coaxial technique, some cavity technique, free space technique, and then uh, this fabricated structure based technique. Therefore, depending upon the sample property, uh, the appropriate technique we have used. For example, these are some of the absorbing samples we made in the lab. Uh, they are all uh, uh, graphene embedded in PVA, and uh, depending upon and the amount of graphene incorporated in the PVA, the, uh, the absorption changes. And these absorption changes, uh, that, that is what it is, and their conductivity and transmission changes, and uh, their absorption also changes. They, they, they take the film like that and uh, cut a section which will go exactly into that structure, and then we can measure as a function of frequency. Right? This is for uh, this kind of a sample. And uh, for liquids, we have to use a coaxial probe. Uh, for uh, thin film at the spot frequency, you can use a split post direct resonator. And uh, for thin films, uh, if you want to measure our range of frequencies, we have to measure at a structure like this. We have to pattern at a structure like this. And then we have to do on wafer probing. Uh, and then uh, if it is uh, uh, in some other case of materials, a resonator structure will be more useful. Each one has got its own advantages and the limitations. And uh, depending upon situation, we have to choose which technique to use. And uh, according to appropriate uh, test structure, we have to devise and uh, data, data detection procedures to use. For thin films, we had to use this kind of a patterned uh, structures. The uh, films we had to first deposit on the substrate, or the test structures has to be patterned. And then uh, these uh, probes has to be brought lowered uh, onto the surface by looking through the microscope. And this is that setup. This is network analyzer. This is the probe station. And there, uh, these uh, coaxial probes are directed to the, um, uh, the test uh, structure, which is on the film, uh, using uh, through the appropriate probes. And these uh, DC bias are all uh, uh, given to it uh, using uh, this. Uh, uh, using with the help of these uh, bias T's and DC blocks, and this is a test setup. This is an on wafer measurement setup for thin film based uh, um, uh, for the measuring the properties of thin films and thin film based devices. We had to use this uh, on wafer probe station. The, uh, the, the, uh, the corresponding uh, this is for, for this instrument, the corresponding diagram is this one we have the network analyzer, bias T, DC power supply, uh, then DC block, then this is a device. Uh, with this probe station and this uh, ground signal ground probes. That is the one which is implemented in that uh, picture which I shown. And uh, for a narrow band uh, uh, measurement, we can use an interdigitated capacitor structure like this. This is, in fact, this what you see in the blue is the film. And above that, this is a patterned interdigitated capacitor structure. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the probes, ground and signal probes will land over this and this. And with that, we can do the measurement. Or uh, this is a circular patch capacitor. You have this is the own electrode, this is the central electrode in between you have the film. And uh, uh, by probing uh, between the, at, uh, this, uh, these three points uh, using a, a GSG probe, we'll be able to measure its uh, properties. And uh, uh, see for this uh, film, uh, this you uh, made a ferroelectric uh, thin film and um, based a capacitor, and we measure the uh, capacitance see, without any bias voltage. This is the uh, capacitance with the 30 volt bias voltage. This is the capacitance. And, uh, and, and, uh, and this is for uh, another material uh, that uh, here, um, uh, this uh, uh, with respect to bias, the capacitance changes uh, to this section. For uh, uh, depending upon the type of capacitor we use, the material. Uh, okay, the, the first one is for interdigitated capacitor. Here, the fee because the gap is more, the field uh, seen by the material will be less. That is why the old uh, capacitance change here will be less. But here, it is uh, field is applied across the film. Therefore, with a um, uh, small change in uh, field, we hear the uh, small change in voltage, you'll get a large change in capacitance. That's the advantage of this uh, structure. And uh, uh, for broadband uh, microwave, uh, uh, for measurement of the properties of the thin films in the broad range of micro frequencies, see on the, see on the film, uh, we have to pattern this kind of a coplanar wave structure. Uh, generally, we um, uh, we design a coplanar waveguide of 50 ohm uh, impedance, and that will be uh, patterned onto the film, and then uh, it will be probed. And from the characters of the, uh, the um, uh, 
coplanar wave gate uh, pattern on the film uh, and comparing that with the characteristics of the same uh, uh, transmission line pattern on to a bare substrate is possible to deduce the material properties uh, for example um, uh, the same uh, barium strontium titanate uh, barium strontium titanate is a standard uh, ferroelectric film when it is deposited over different uh, substrates uh, when we measured the dielectric constant of it uh, in, in fact uh, this is how it is see this uh, um, uh, this is for uh, 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 sapphire and this is for ngo and this is for uh, uh, this uh, um, fusilica and uh, accordingly the, that see basically uh, when the film is grown over different substrates because of various uh, interface uh, uh, aspects the uh, the dielectric constant of the film will be different and uh, that can be accurately measured by putting these structures on the films grown over uh, different substrates and uh, measured by this uh, uh, pro uh, problem technique so that that's what is uh, displayed here the first is uh, Mm. Uh, therefore, uh, without uh, first knowing the properties of these films, we cannot proceed further. We cannot make a device out of it. So, but uh, to measure the pro dielectric properties in the micro range, uh, that itself requires this kind of a pattern. Mm. And what we are seeing is when the same film, barium strontium titanate, BST, uh, deposited over different uh, substrates, the, di the, di the dielectric constant is different. And by knowing the dielectric constant only, we know the electrical length on the material. Then only, based on that only, we can design the, uh, any device. Therefore, measurement is the first step. That measurement itself requires patterning and this kind of different. And there is, again, depending upon the substrate and depending upon the processing, properties are going to be different. And corresponding to these dielectric constants, the, uh, the, uh, the loss values are this. And this is the dielectric constant itself for the film deposited over land and eliminate. And these are all the corresponding loss values. And uh, uh, now briefly I will uh, mention, uh, this is just for, uh, 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 since I told about microwave and many will be using micro energy for uh, calcination, sintering and uh, uh, nanocrystal growth. But uh, very briefly mention about uh, those things which, in which uh, our experience in that aspects. We use a microwave sintering system like this and uh, uh, we know that uh, microwave heating means it is uh, in situ generation of heat inside the sample itself by exploiting the um, uh, sample uh, field interaction. If the sample is a little lossy, either because of the uh, um, uh, epsilon double prime or mu double prime or sigma double prime, it will uh, interact with the incoming field and generate the, um, uh, uh, and the uh, electromagnetic energy will be absorbed and converted into uh, the thermal energy then and there. Uh, in, the case of, uh, um, uh, uh, in the case of conventional heating arrangement, uh, the, the uh, heating elements will produce heat uh, that will be radiated into the sample. Here the heat is generated inside the sample itself. And uh, if the sample cannot reproduce, uh, uh, cannot absorb microwave by itself, what we use is we use a susceptor or a crucible that is generally made of uh, silicon carbide. That will absorb the energy and pass it on to um, the material. There, fast heating is possible. And uh, there is not fully, uh, it will not give the complete effect of the microwave heating, but uh, often it gives very close results. And uh, one thing which you can see is, uh, to get a high density sintering in a material like a barium zinc tantalate, it is very difficult to sinter. Conventionally, it requires 1600 degrees Celsius uh, heating for 25 hours, mm, then density over 95 degrees. The same density was achieved uh, with the micro heating at 1400 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. Same density is achieved. And not only that, in conventional grain, uh, growth, we can see that the grains are too big. But in the micro heating, we can see grains are very small. So there is no time for the grains to grow. But densification happens. In many technologies, the, this is the ideal situation. They want uh, fine grains um, with the high density. In fact, that is possible with the microwave sintering. And uh, uh, this is another case uh, of, uh, see, this strontium titanate. This uh, ceramic, uh, in fact, people are not able to study their uh, uh, this uh, saturated ferroelectric properties. Under, uh, uh, their photo properties under saturation because uh, to study their photo properties uh, like hysteresis, it apply a large field, but they conduct. Therefore, normally with the conventional sintered cases, only this much data is possible. But uh, when we used, uh, when we sintered this material with the micro energy, since the process is very fast, uh, there is not much time for business to get lost. As a result, business stoichiometry is retained and that resulted in uh, that uh, 
the property of strontium bismuth is getting highly improved uh, in terms of leakage current and because of uh, this uh, bismuth loss the leakage current increases and by by fast processing bismuth loss was avoided and with that uh, in fact uh, we got uh, the high the material got highly densified without uh, much of bismuth loss and as well that could be saturated and with that we are able to study the property of the material in the in the saturated condition in fact this is just an example uh, this is in the case of uh, uh, lead loss material so any volatile material cases micro sintering is very helpful because of the fast this is a slightly different one in this case uh, uh, what is possible is in the, in the, in the, uh, the solution which we generally use for solo thermal process if we uh, take it and uh, subject to microwave heating uh, in fact uh, in may depend upon the uh, processes which you use it is possible to get uh, uh, nano rods nano wires and things like that and uh, another in this case what we obtain for barium titanate is uh, meso crystals of barium titanate meso crystals means uh, the crystallites aligned uh, in a crystallographic manner this the whole thing is a crystal but the unit cells are crystallites of the same material therefore it is the, the, the overall uh, the, 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 the overall is a fragile material only but each uh, building block is a you know, crystallite of uh, in our case barium titanate that's called meso crystal mm -hmm. and uh, there is a lot and in fact getting that is not that easy but anyway with uh, by heating the soil uh, uh, of the uh, uh, that is required for preparing barium titanate uh, with the micro energy we are able to get the meso crystals and that is uh, um, established through this PEM analysis that uh, in fact I am not getting into the much details of it but uh, by three PEM analysis we are able to establish that uh, that um, uh, indeed the crystallites uh, this agglomeration in these crystallites are all uh, aligned in the same direction mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, 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 this uh, uh, the it is an ensemble of uh, crystals of barium titrant all aligned along a crystallographic direction and uh, therefore it is a meso crystal their properties are interesting uh, primarily uh, this one that is uh, normally barium titan is diamagnetic but uh, these meso crystals what we found is that they exhibit a uh, slight magnetism mm -hmm. that uh, we found that that is uh, driven primarily from oxygen deficiency uh, but that's uh, interesting therefore uh, we get uh, uh, meso crystals and their properties are uh, in fact we found that they are uh, good for emitting terahertz also uh, and also they exhibit a slight mag magnetism by using this magnetism, it is we found that it is possible to generate rods with these materials. And uh, for preparing, as I mentioned, if you want to um, uh, use any material power or microwave devices, first thing is we have to make the material, and then we have to characterize them in the microwave frequency range. For uh, some of the characterization techniques, I mentioned briefly. Now I'll mention briefly about the preparation techniques we use. Um, that uh, the specific techniques we use are R sputtering and uh, pulse laser deposition and uh, the, we work uh, um, uh, primarily with the ferroelectrics and uh, when it comes to ferroelectrics uh, these materials in the below their curie temperature they exhibit hysteresis but the above curie uh, temperature in the paraelectric stage uh, their dielectric constant is highly field dependent see as the field increases dielectric constant decreases and uh, this field dependent uh, dielectric permittivity leads to uh, field dependent capacitors that means it becomes a varactor, say for electric varactor. That leads to tunability. And uh, as I mentioned, for uh, uh, this uh, 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 a typical material which will uh, for electric which is very suitable for this application, barium strontium titanate, because its curie temperature is just below room temperature, that we can adjust uh, even upon the barium strontium ratio. And that the fact the room temperature is in the paraelectric state. There, uh, depending upon the substrate we use. Their properties slightly differ, as I showed some time back. And uh, uh, this is uh, a, a material which can be uh, uh, really utilized for uh, uh, this micro device application. Therefore, we are concentrating on that. And uh, uh, the one technique we uh, uh, seriously use is RF sputtering. RF sputtering. This is our three target sputtering system. And uh, these are the sputtering targets which we made in the lab itself. They are on above 90%. Uh, uh, density and uh, by the way, these are all this uh, uh, the certain target technology um, uh, in our lab uh, was established by one of our early students. Now he is an associate professor in IIT uh, Gauhati. Uh, 
uh, he has launched a startup uh, which sells these uh, sputtering targets and uh, that is an interesting <laughs> related development and uh, uh, then uh, other technique is uh, pulse laser deposition in fact nowadays for complex oxides we use more of pulse laser deposition and for electrodes we use more of uh, this rs sputtering and also for metallic uh, targets we, uh, the films we use uh, rs sputtering and for ceramics we use mostly pulse laser deposition in the case of uh, pulse laser deposition the main advantage is the the source is outside the system therefore the complexity comes down and therefore uh, vacuum control is easier Heat, uh, heating the substrate and uh, he is heating the substrate is uh, uh, it's a less cumbersome therefore that we, we found in so many ways uh, this uh, pulse laser deposition technique is easier to handle uh, to get good results with uh, oxide thin films the complex oxide thin films and these are some of the conditions under which we grow these films i don't go into much details uh, this is our lab where we use uh, lasers one is an excimer laser another one is an indiag laser which is sitting here and uh, we have a uh, mm, uh, this is the primary pld system this is a, a laser mbe system and this is a laser annealing system and uh, 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 the laser annealing is a pro another process that we uh, 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 that, that is used to make this ferroelectric process compatible with that of semiconductors because the normal pld which we uh, do uh, it, it's a temperature the, the, the see the you know, therefore to get a good quality film for bst uh, we had to deposit the film at a 700 degrees celsius and most of the semiconductor processes these days uh, won't uh, withstand 700 degrees celsius for you want a process which can be done mm, at, a, uh, at a lower temperature and uh, mm, for that what we do is we uh, depo uh, uh, we use a process called laser annealing what we do is uh, at 300 degrees Celsius, we deposit the film. After that, we expose that uh, film to an expanded beam of laser, which will, instead of ablating it, it will anneal it. Uh, and therefore, the whole process is done at a 300 degrees Celsius. And uh, it means the XML laser is coming and it is uh, um, okay, hitting on a BST target and uh, that forms a film. And after the uh, forming, the uh, this is the first part, and then, uh, that is at, uh, done at 300 degrees Celsius. And on the same film, after that, an expanded beam of uh, laser is allowed to fall, um, and uh, uh, that laser um, uh, annealed the film at the same temperature, 300 degrees Celsius. We are able to get a crystallization at 300 degrees Celsius. So this temperature is compatible with uh, the silicon processing uh, of the present day processes. For that way, because one of the major issues is um, uh, getting this. Uh, 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 this uh, ferroelectric films uh, process compatible with the semiconductors. In fact, uh, this way it is possible. And, uh, 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 and we found that, in fact, uh, this is a TEM analysis of it. We found that the crystallization is happening up to 120 nanometer uh, depth. Beyond that, the uh, process is not happening. Therefore, uh, but uh, for our process, we need uh, some around 600 nanometer thickness. What we did was Whatever process I was mentioning, we repeated it to, uh, five times. Uh, one time for relative layer deposition at 300 degrees Celsius, then annealing at 300 degrees Celsius, then repeat the process five times. Like that, we got uh, uh, 600 nanometer thickness film, all crystallized, and uh, uh, that's what this is a fine, uh, it's a um, 600 nanometer thickness film. Each layer crystallizes separately uh, using with the help of uh, laser energy. So instead of 700 degrees Celsius, we are able to do the process at 300 degrees Celsius. And uh, one shouldn't complete a PhD with that process development. And uh, uh, with uh, uh, these uh, films, which are grown either by RS sputtering or PLD or by laser annealing, we may proceed to make microwave devices. Uh, and uh, the devices which we made in our laboratory are dielectric resonators, ferroelectric thin film based reactors, tunable filters, phase shifters, high overton bulk resonators, and now we are working on film bulk acoustic resonators. And this is the dielectric resonator. In, we, here we use uh, uh, low loss dielectrics like uh, zirconium, and titanate, barium, zinc, tantalate, uh, some of these compositions we use. And uh, they are all just uh, uh, cylindrical pellets. And uh, microfield which is going into it will, uh, because of the high dielectric constant, will be confined to it. So it will be like if, uh, it, uh, the, the, whole, the pellet of high dielectric constant and low loss material itself will act like a resonant. And uh, uh, to measure its properties, 
uh, we connect it to the network analyzer using different data structures and uh, measure it. This is to uh, to identify the mode and the uh, sound uh, frequency of the each mode. We use one setup to measure the quality factor of each mode. We use another setup and to measure the temperature coefficient of the sound frequency. We use another setup. Uh, for, this is the first device we made in the laboratory. This is an uh, it is an ISRO project and. Uh, mm, and the student who uh, uh, developed uh, the process for uh, sputtering targets, uh, his name is Dr. Pamu, and he, he worked on this. And uh, uh, see, if you want to, uh, as I mentioned, if you want to make a test, uh, if you want to measure the microwave dielectric properties of these films in the microwave range, first we need to pattern a test structure. And for the patterning the test structure itself, we have to, you have to go through the usual uh, patterning etching. Uh, process uh, till we get uh, either IDC structure or a planar rigid structure or a circular patch capacitor, then we come for this measurement. And once this measurement is done, then we uh, design the device using these films by knowing the characters of the material. And uh, I, in fact, uh, the, one of the uh, a good device which we can uh, make is for electric reactor, and uh, its properties can be compared with that of semiconductor di uh, this uh, uh, reactor diode. And RF MEMS uh, reactor, and what we can see is that means air bridge based structure, hmm? the usual RF MEMS structure, and uh, we can see that see that uh, uh, all three are competing technologies. Early only semiconductor pin junction diode was there, and uh, in fact uh, the problem with that is at the high frequencies there is loss. That is why people are looking for. But now RF MEMS reactors are there, and uh, as you know the packaging is issue, miniature is, is, is an issue, and uh, Compared to that, this uh, ferrotive reactor uh, offers a lot of advantages and it is uh, a low-cost process. In our lab, we are able to make it. It means in an academic lab itself, we can make the device. Therefore, it, it, uh, therefore uh, investment uh, as a standalone process, one can uh, um, develop this uh, reactor technology and integrate into various uh, uh, substrates and uh, uh, make various uh, um, uh, uh, system-level applications. In fact, I'll come to that briefly. This is a um, that, um, the structure for measuring the properties of these reactors. Uh, this is a coplanar wave guided structure in which these reactors are incorporated here. We probe this uh, CPW structure because these reactors are too small. Uh, but the probe station, uh, this uh, ground signal ground probes uh, are up, have got a pitch of 250 micron. That is why we go for this kind of a structure. The, the reactor here is like this. And uh, this is a fabricated uh, the structure with the reactor here. Here, and here. this is the reactor. And uh, uh, see this. Uh, this is the uh, capacitance of this capacitor without any bias. As we keep on increasing the bias voltage from two volt to ten volt, capacitance keep on decreasing. That way we can see that this is a voltage dependent capacitor. So it is a reactor. Uh, BST capacitor acts as a reactor. This is fabricated in our lab. And uh, using this the reactor, we can de design a, a filter because the reactor is a building block for so many primary circuits. One is a filter. In a filter, if you use this, uh, um, uh, uh, if we have made a, a tunable filter using these reactors. This is a, a, a picture of it. This is after fabrication of it. Uh, this is a tunable filter, the test structure for it. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, like this tunable filter, there is tunable phase shifter, and tunable delay line, tunable matching network, tunable impedance. Many of them are there. They are all related. In fact, in all these things, the primary element is the reactor. Once we have the reactor, the reactor based other applications, uh, related applications are all possible. But uh, the next key fundamental device, like the reactor, is the resonator. The reactor is a key element. With that, many devices is possible. Like this, another key element is a resonator. In the case of resonator, it is very important because uh, in the case of a microwave frequency, in the microwave frequency range, the wavelength is a little large. For example, uh, that uh, at 2 gigahertz range, wavelength of electromagnetic wave is uh, 150 centimeter. But uh, in uh, uh, that uh, uh, piezoelectric material, when the wave enters, the, uh, the, the electromagnetic wave get converted into acoustic wave, its uh, velocity is uh, 10 power 4 times less than that of the electromagnetic wave. Frequency remains same, 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz. What are the frequency? Frequency remains same, but the velocity came down by a factor of 10 power 4. As a result, 
the um, that uh, uh, the wave length comes down drastically. Uh, the fact two gigahertz, uh, if electromagnetic waves uh, gives a velocity uh, wave length of 150 centimeter, uh, that uh, um, at two gigahertz, uh, sorry, point, sorry, uh, uh, 15 centimeter, not 150, sorry. Uh, at uh, two gigahertz, if electromagnetic waves got a, a wave length of 15 centimeter, uh, that um, uh, this acoustic, acoustic wave uh, corresponding um, wave length of the acoustic wave is 171 nanometer. That is why miniaturization is possible uh, once we convert uh, the energy into acoustic uh, energy. That is why people go for electroacoustic conversion uh, using um, uh, this piece of electrofilm. Therefore, the best way to achieve miniaturized resonators is to go for electroacoustic resonators. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, uh, practically all the filters in a mobile phone nowadays are with uh, micro these electroacoustic type resonators. And uh, uh, the, the two well-known uh, types of it, one is uh, so, surface acoustic wave, one is bulk acoustic wave resonators. Both are in use, but the saw is a little larger and used at lower frequencies. Bow is used at the gigahertz range. This is the case with the saw, so that is surface acoustic wave. This is basically irradiator capacitor structure. And uh, when the electromagnetic field is applied to it, uh, the corresponding uh, acoustic oscillation will be generated because of the piezoelectric effect uh, of the uh, material layer which is beneath it. And uh, then, it will, because of the, the reverse, the converse piece of electric effect, it will be converted back into electromagnetic energy, and what comes out will be still electromagnetic energy. So, this is a surface acoustic wave uh, resonator. And, uh, and at the gigahertz range, what is better is uh, there are a number of problems with the uh, surface acoustic wave resonator, but uh, a gigahertz range better is to go for a bulk acoustic wave resonator. Because it will be small in size and it got a better performance and uh, uh, fabrication process for bulk acoustic resonator is compatible with that of silicon dust and uh, primarily it make use of a uh, capacitor uh, with uh, uh, this uh, piezoelectric layer as the layer between the two electrodes and uh, the well-known piezoelectrics are zinc oxide aluminum nitride uh, or lead circonate titanate and we have seen that we have used barium strontium titanate and that also can be used uh, and, uh, with some advantages, I'll show that. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is the uh, this is uh, here, here we have uh, two electrodes of uh, uh, this bow uh, structure, and here electroacoustic conversion happens. But uh, uh, that uh, uh, there need to be an acoustic impedance mismatch between this bottom electrode and the substrate. That is, uh, in this case, an air cavity is micro machined. In this case, the entire substrate is etched off. Uh, in this case. Uh, using uh, multiple layers of uh, materials with the different uh, 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 this acoustic impedance with a high and low acoustic impedance with the uh, with a high contrast of the acoustic impedance here uh, a Bragg reflector is made and that brings in a, a reflect the energy back therefore we need a res resonator by, by one of these methods a resonance can be achieved and uh, the structure we have considered is like this and uh, the, the, this is a uh, 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 bow uh, uh, structure in which uh, uh, this uh, um, this is the basically the resonator part, the, 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 the electrocost conversion part this is a substrate. The general energy generator here get transmitted to this. And if you etch off the substrate, it becomes F bar. If you do not etch off the substrate, it becomes H bar, high overton bulk acoustic resonator. And uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, see this is uh, uh, what you have fabricated. Uh, this is the electroacoustic um, uh, the resonator below that is substrate. In this case, what happens is uh, that uh, uh, the electroacoustic resonance happens here, and that uh, generated uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, that that, uh, that resonant uh, pattern keep advancing over the structure uh, up to the end of the substrate. There again, there is an electroacoustic impedance mismatch. From there, it will get reflected back. For the whole structure, the the here is a uh, this. Uh, uh, the conversion, electroacoustic conversion happens here. It gets transmitted through the substrate, get reflected back. Finally, it becomes like a fabric or a hmm? You get a standing wave structure, and that's what is happening here. Hmm? Therefore, we get a series of resonances. Hmm? And uh, okay, the fabrication of that is done in our clean room in the university. Uh, this is the uh, the different parts of the clean room. That is where we do the fabrication, and uh, we get a series of resonances. Uh, the, uh, just as I have uh, shown that uh, there is a fabric period, it's not like a structure, but we get a number of resonances like that. 
Now, one thing important is, see, in the, since in the case of we have used barium strontium titanate, when we don't apply any bias voltage, it is just a paraelectric. Therefore, it is not piezoelectric. Therefore, response is just a straight line. When you apply a bias voltage, it becomes piezoelectric because it induces piezoelectric effect, induces electrostriction. And then it gives this uh, uh, multiple resonances. And these resonances are different uh, that uh, for different uh, substrates. And uh, uh, here we have used uh, substrates like uh, uh, YAG and, uh, and this uh, sapphire, silicon, and diffuse silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, that the first one is for YAG, this is for uh, sapphire, this is for silicon, this is for uh, fuse silica. With uh, these uh, different uh, substrates, we get a different type of resonance system and uh, with the different Q values. And based on that, we will get uh, the uh, metal parameters. Uh, 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 various material parameters uh, uh, corresponding to these structures we will be able to derive and accordingly in each of these materials YAG, SAFA, silicon, fuel silica corresponding acoustic velocities like that. From that we can calculate acoustic impedance. And also with respect to the, um, uh, the different thickness of the, uh, uh, the substrate again resonance characteristics changes. And therefore, these are the results of that H bar which is fabricated. And uh, this is that uh, what I was mentioning. Without any bias, uh, it, it is a paraelectric and get a, we get a straight response. There is, there is no activity at all. But when you ask, you increase the bias voltage from 0 to 30 volt across the uh, H bar capacitor, see, the, uh, it become the electrostriction starts settling in and as a result, the resonance starts growing. So it becomes a switchable resonator. That is advantage by using a, a material like BST, which can be switched from paraelectric state to paraelectric state by the application of an electromagnetic field. And uh, see, in fact, they have got uh, uh, various applications in material characterization, material, and in as a, because they are the Q, Q, the Q value of the uh, peak, highest peak Q value of the peak which you obtained is uh, the, uh, is thirty five thousand. It's resonance. We got resonances up to a Q value of 35,000. They are important in microwave sources for stabilized microwave sources, and uh, they, they are important for sensors, and also they are important in quantum acoustic devices. And uh, uh, in, uh, okay, my time is almost up, I will soon complete. And uh, uh, in the back side of the substrate uh, and, and of this H bar uh, structure, we quoted uh, a polymer uh, CU8, and immediately what we found is that. The resonance pattern is changing. Mm -hmm. With the 2.1 micron thickness of the SU8 uh, quartered, the pattern has changed like this. With the uh, 3.2 micron, it has changed like this. As, increases th in, as the thickness increases further, it changes like that. And uh, that will be quite sensitive, especially if we look in individual peaks, their Q value is as high as uh, 35,000. Therefore, what we see is the back side of the resonator, if you caught a material, even that is affecting the resonance structure. Therefore, it can be used as a, a sensor, especially if it is uh, um, uh, that um, uh, uh, this functionalized. It, uh, the, we can coat uh, this uh, back side of the resonator with uh, um, um, any polymer. Immediately, the response is seen. And if you functionalize that polymer, that changes can be seen in the individual resonances itself. So that it, it can be used as a sensor. Uh, and, uh, and these aspects uh, recently came up in. Uh, IEEE transactions on uh, UFFC. And uh, uh, then, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, uh, tunable metamity, uh, okay, that using these varactors which uh, uh, we have developed, it is possible to make tunable metamaterial antenna with a variable reactant surface. The idea is in, uh, right now in the mobile handset, the radiation goes in all directions, including in the tower, hmm? but the most of the energy is wasted. Now, the next effort which is going on is when you use a handset, Depending upon the tower position, radiation should go only there. So that the same frequency can be used by other people in other directions. And not only that, by, uh, by, by, by transmit, if we are tra communicating only with the tower, uh, then the uh, amount of power uh, radiated can be uh, reduced. That will reduce the R of pollution very much it, because it has got a health hazard also. And, uh, and not only that, this uh, battery life can be saved. Therefore, the, because of this multiple advantage, what is being done is nowadays uh, we uh, when we are using a mobile phone, the power should be radiated only to the uh, tower, and uh, that is possible by using a, a, a tunable metamaterial lantern. 
with the variable reactant surface. There, there are various ways to implement that concept. One is having a large number of uh, radiating surfaces interconnected with the uh, um, reactors and, uh, uh, and using appropriate uh, substrates where these reactors can be fabricated. The reactors which we have fabricated in our lab can be integrated with this kind of a concept that uh, system is being designed with the help of an industry. Our objective is to get this kind of a, a tunable, um, uh, and a reconfigurable and active a variable invading surface and, uh, uh, so that radiation can be uh, uh, directed only to the tower. That is the natural next step that we are taking. And uh, uh, just one or two slides. And uh, uh, another important aspect for uh, both, uh, as I mentioned, that we have primarily developed the reactors and resonators. Using these resonators and the reactors, um, and, uh, the, some of the next important application possible is one is non-magnetic and non-reciprocal devices uh, for duplex communications and uh, quantum acoustic devices. See, that is, uh, the, this is one of the next major step in electro communication electronics that is, uh, that uh, uh, use the same circuits for onward and reverse communication. That is, uh, achieving diplex operation uh, or, or duplex communication. Uh, that, that is possible provided we have a circulator. But uh, generally circulators are made with uh, uh, magnetic materials, as I mentioned, uh, magnets cannot be miniaturized and as a result uh, that they were looking for non-magnet based uh, duplex communication technique. The people found that it is possible to achieve a circulator function without a magnet by using a reactor and a resonator. Therefore now we are planning to make use of the reactors and resonators we have developed uh, for um, uh, achieving this kind of uh, this uh, magnet free and non-reciprocal uh, devices like a circulator that is very much useful for 5G full duplex communication and also they are important for quantum computing because in quantum computing uh, one of the implementation uses cryogenic electronics using superconductors there uh, that uh, hemmed amplifiers are used the noise associated with that uh, should not go into the, uh, the electronics which is kept at the lower temperature. For that, uh, in fact, uh, we need to have a non-reciprocal communication system. Therefore, uh, this kind of a uh, uh, reactor and uh, resonator based non-reciprocal um, uh, circulators are very important for achieving uh, for this kind of quantum computers. And these are different implementations of that. I will not get into the details of it. Another one is using the, see this uh, high Q resonances in the micro frequency range is extremely important. And uh, uh, this, um, uh, and in fact, as I told, we, we, we got a, a Q of 35,000. It can be further increased if you go for uh, um, the diamond or silicon garbage substrate. And at low temperatures, it will be still higher. And this kind of extremely high Qs are very important for time standards and for uh, uh, this uh, quantum qubits and also for this uh, coupling uh, into this uh, phonon uh, and a phonon based uh, um, uh, coupling with the phonon networks. For that, this kind of high Q because phonon frequencies and micro frequencies are uh, in the same range. For it established com there are coupling between them, we need this kind of high Q uh, micro miniaturized micro resonators. For that, also these uh, high Q miniaturized resonators are being used. And uh, this is the last portion. And uh, in fact, with all that, uh, uh, a better uh, microwave de miniaturized device is possible with the magneto electric multi layers. Thus, magneto electric multi layers give high electric constant and uh, high uh, permittivity. And uh, um, uh, the magnetic materials are magnetically tunable. Electric material, uh, the, uh, the associated ferroelectrics are electrically tunable. But then, uh, the, but the, as I mentioned, magnets cannot be miniaturized. Therefore, what is being done is we apply the electric field. That electric field will create strain. That strain will co uh, couple to the magnetic layer. By mag the magnetostricty effect, the magnetic materials property will be uh, tuned. Therefore, we, are, we can achieve magnetic tuning through the electric field using magnetic electric multi layers. And that way, miniaturize the non reciprocal devices, highly tunable devices, and extremely miniaturized micro devices are possible. For example, because of the high permittivity and permeability um, uh, offered by magnetoelectric multi layers, it is possible to make uh, and, uh, embedded antennas in the micron range. Those things are nowadays being used for coupling to neurons and for embedding in the uh, neuron systems. Therefore, uh, this magnetoelectric multi layers for uh, next generation microwaves uh, devices is quite important. And uh, now we are 
looking into that activity and some students are working on that and uh, this is how so this is one typical uh, structure that uh, uh, using bct the reservatory part eg is an anchor part and the substrate is ggg and uh, with that uh, these resonators are coupled to a microstrip transmitter resonator there see basically uh, with a small change in um, uh, bias field large change in resonance is obtained so this is from literature these kind of things are possible with the magnetic electric multilayers so with that i conclude in summary i will say that the interface between materials and micro frequency range uh, uh, micro frequency electromagnetic field is very important microwave technology requires materials other than semiconductors for various purposes the microwave characterization techniques are material and their property dependent loss uh, low loss dielectrics variable dielectric constant materials and electroacoustic couplings are very important miniaturized devices require highly reliable thin film fabrication processes and process compatibility with the semiconductor processing is important and laser annealing helps in that and with the uh, ferroelectric thin films we fabricated reactors resonators variable filters and phase shifters these basic devices are being used for designing reconfigurable antennas high resonators um, high q resonators are useful for uh, quantum acoustic devices and magnet free non reciprocal circulators and next high ground is magneto electric multi layers to facilitate electric tuning of magnetic uh, properties and that is what we are uh, getting into also thank you uh, many thanks professor raju for your uh, uh, interesting talk and very very useful talk uh, i i just stop it yeah